I wanted to do an experiment uh, in imagining what the rule of law is in certain contexts. Uh, the title of my paper is um, Digging Law. It's really that slang about understanding law, but it also has a metaphorical con connotation. Uh, we have been working for 10 years in Chad, as has been said. And one of the things I've been doing uh, in Chad when it's raining and I can't go anywhere is actually to look at the whole infrastructure of the oil company. And since my project is on the rule of law in Chad, I had come to realize progressively that there, is, there are actually similarities between extractive industries, the technology that one puts in place to extract uh, stuff from the soil, and the rule of law which actually is, in many ways, a technology of extraction too. Um, the rule of law, as you know, can mean many things, obviously. Uh, the Soviet Union, it's been argued, was a rule of law country. The rule of law simply means that you have a set of laws that are implemented predictably to which people are subject, and etc. And, and, and you can go down the line. So the rule of law, we obsess about it, it's like democracy. We talk about it as if we actually knew what it did. The context of the rule of law matters just as drilling for oil matters. And this is actually how I've come to look at the rule of law, and I'm going to give you a little experiment. Um, I had to learn in Chad when I got there something called rigs, which I had not known about. And these rigs are, of course, online somewhere, which means that somebody's land has to be taken. And they have to be connected to, to oil somewhere, to oil wells somewhere below. And that from those oil wells, they have pipes that go to processing plants. And those processing plants can be manifold, they can lead to multiple things. And, 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 and those actually obviously drain them somewhere to a, a, a point in, in, at, in Chad, in, in Krivi, in Cameroon, I'm sorry. And then they get loaded onto something. But what is interesting about it is, is not only the assemblages that actually operate this, it is what is visible and what is not visible. The oil well, for instance, is not visible. Um, no other control rooms, because something is privileged, something has to be controlled, something has to be kept for many, multiple reasons, secret it, in, in its own fashion, and secret may not be how they call it. So these oil platforms, obviously, in Chad are on land, but in many places in the world, I've learned that they can also be offshore, uh, and that they are in off, on offshore, they are actually affixed to, to the floor of the ocean. Um, and, and, and obviously they are connected to these artificial floating islands and etc. And of course, even there, there are things that are hidden away, things that are not that are not visible to us, to people who consume oil, or not even people people who are on the platforms. But they are connected again to control rooms and where everything is orchestrated to, to make all this operation possible. Which is actually interesting to me because I started looking at the process in which laws were made in relation to the oil production in Chad. And I began to not resist the temptation of connecting the rule of law to that process. Because in the rule of law, obviously, when people lapse into frankness, we actually talk about extracting consent, extracting legitimacy, extracting, we extract all of these. Which means that consent is not always given. We set in place processes that actually give, lead us to, to consent, right? So I began to see that, that in fact, the rule of law is not possible without, a, without beginning where oil companies begin, with, which has to be rigging. You have to rig something together, right? And rigging becomes a metaphor for me for, for assemblages. And rigging is not necessarily cheating, in fact. It is putting together an assemblage of instruments, uh, an assemblage of, of tools that actually have particular instrumentality, that they lead you to something, right? The rule of law, of course, is an assemblage for people who study it of legal instrument, of interpretive, interpretive devices, of jurisprudential canons, all of them brought together by agents of the state, corporation, global finance, and etc. So there are multiple things that bring the rule of law together. And you can already begin, begin to see the riggings and, 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 and etc. and how these devices are put together. Um, in financially poor but resource rich countries, obviously the rigging is done by the agents that do this rigging, that put these things together, are not of equal power. Some of them are more equal than others. So you begin to think of, again, 
this platform, floating things in oceans or onshore, you begin to see actually these sovereign entities. You have the World Bank, you have the state, you have corporations, and you have all of these things that are all in involved in manufacturing these laws and putting together what is the rule of law, what leads us to, to understand property as we do, to understand security as we do, to understand justice as we do, to understand compensation as we do. All of these things are involved in it. And of course, they, they go through multiple channels before they come there. So um, obviously, um, all this happens according to a plan. Right? It's like, again, in all production, you have a plan. Ultimately, it's the good. There's a plan that leads to this attraction of good, even though you have these multiple platforms that, that right, they all converge to our things. And the rule of law actually converges to a, to a certain point. I do know that if you are lawyers in, in this room who either are in the legal who are non-positivists, loosely speaking, they will tell you that laws are indeterminate and etc. in the application, etc. And I'm not actually interested in how particular laws might be interpreted or whether occasionally the law might benefit somebody to, for whom it was not intended. I'm actually talking about the instrumentality of assembly in the assemblage at the moment of assemblage. Right? So if you can think of, of the rule of law in charge, you can't actually, if you want to understand how law works, you have to understand this platform. This, and and in, in institutional terms, we, you actually conceive of them as autonomous sovereign spaces, right? And, and when we say autonomous sovereign spaces, you, you mean that, that they have spheres of authority. Each one of them is sovereign. Corporations are very sovereign in their spaces, right? We have been talking here about all extraction and, and et cetera, as if everything they do is available and accessible to us, and as if corporations actually work for the people in charge or in, in the case of Zambia and et cetera. But they actually have particular interests, they have particular uh, uh, spheres of interest and in which they protect, and, and, and therefore particular activities are linked to that about which on, on which they are absolutely sovereign. Not even the state knows what they do. We've been talking here about meters and how much oil flows and et cetera. The state also has those kind of spheres, and the World Bank, of course, in the case of Chad, because it's a resource, financially poor, research-rich country, the World Bank, who, who modeled this, this project, of course, had, it, had a role to play, right? Um, and I think it, it is, so that's how, how you begin to understand that, that how they are connected together also matters. And they are connected together by institutional nodes. And, and again, in the concept of rule of law, you actually do not begin to understand the rule of law until you understand in each spheres of sovereignty what kind of immunities they have, what they can do by law without being liable, what kind of privileges they have, what state allows the World Bank and corporations to do, what the World Bank allows the state and corporations to do, and vice versa. That in all of those cases, they actually all have privileges, which means that they also have liabilities and responsibilities that fall upon them individually and, and singly. It also means that they all have mandate that they understand to be what they should do. The World Bank in charge understands its mandate, as the oil companies understand its own, as the state understands its own. And what those mandates are actually do matter, right? So the rule of law is not actually, it's not what we imagine it to be, to be just some cooperative enterprise somewhere. It is actually a bunch of people who have sovereign powers, who have interests, who act, who, who act together. Now, what a lot of people assume about the rule of law is that it is, all of this is done in the interest of populations, and in charge that will be Chadians, that it was all intended to alleviate power poverty, and etc. So if I were to assess the rule of law in Chad, I actually have to see whether the institution put in Chad, and in the case of Chad, you have revenue management plan, you have the international advisory board, uh, uh, advisory group, you have all man, and then you have ExxonMobil, which has a whole plan of poverty reduction, which includes compensation, and etc. I have to actually see how all those map together, and whether in that context, it is in fact possible to reduce poverty, or whether the nodes and the pipes, how the pipes blow, go, whether they're really about extracting something else other than alleviating po poverty, right? And in the case of child, obviously, uh, you begin to see, when you look at the rule of law, when you look at the responsibilities, the immunities, the privileges, the liabilities, the mandates, and the prohibitions, and etc., you begin to see that they actually have nothing to do with poverty, because nothing in those schemes will lead you to believe that at any point, poverty reduction might be at stake. Even though, again, when we have the rule of law, we always say that it is about something. But that 
about which we say the rule of law is, is not always what the rule of law actually produces. And in fact, what it produces depends on understanding all those platforms, the pipes, the rigging, what goes where, and et cetera, and the sort of spheres of sovereignty, and et cetera. But in the end, the rule of law is actually a process of rigging, an outcome. It leads to a particular outcome, and those rig masters actually know what those ends are. And it's never the people who are the recipient, in the case of Chad, of, of law, who must obey it, and etc. It is actually the rig masters who know what they want. The World Bank actually does know what it wants in Chad. The oil corporations know what they want, and the state knows what it wants. And so if you want to understand the rule of law, you actually have to understand what it is that they want. Right? And, and, and this is where I, I give you uh, a few examples. For instance, I go to Chad and somebody tells me that in the context of Chad, the World Bank says, affirmatively, that in Chad, land belongs to the state. Right? Now, the first thing that happens to me, of course, when I heard, I heard that the first time, was that we live in, in the post-communist era, where actually people are, even USAID is paying money in Benin to privatize land, but in Chad, they are saying that land belongs to the state. And of course, then I have to pull back a bit and say, why would somebody say that in Chad, right? And so where you go first is to, to legal regimes that apply to oil exploration and extraction. Oil has always a component of land involved. And then if you move back, you'll see that, that, oil, that oil companies have always had certain immunities and privileges from the time oil companies started extracting oil in the Middle East, that the sovereignty that they have sovereignty and they have some, some, some immunities, in fact, immunities that those, those, are, those are sovereignty, and that they need to have land. And land is often the way in which poor countries have subsidized oil corporations because they have to give something back besides money, right? So land has to be taken away from somebody to begin with corporations. And in many cases in Africa, it was a very convenient fiction to go back to colonial laws. Colonial laws that assume that Africans have no relations to nature and therefore to land that may qualify as property. Right? But to make that whole, because you cannot, obviously, people in Chad don't resist this, and I'm going to be telling you about what people might imagine property to be in Chad. People in Chad might be upset with this. But the rule of law is not actually in the context of exploration again, just as oil is consumed somewhere by somebody whose, whose sensibilities we must sort of nurture to tell them that everything is being done according to environmental standard and it's okay, nobody's being underpaid and etc. We have to convince those audiences who may have a stake in the rule of law, again for particular political sensibility or culture or whatever, you have to convince them that of course the corporations are doing exactly as things should happen. So what makes it, what is more, what is more convenient than to say that in African culture, in that context, this, the land, that land belongs to the state, right? And the way you do that is, obviously, in the context of Chad, you have various levels of legitimation of that land taking of the land, right? The first point you go, of course, is to anthropologists. Anthropologists have always been wonderful in telling corpor all corporations, including in Chad, what African customs are. Right? So the oil company has an, an anthropologist who tells them how, what land, land rules and, and, and land norms of property were in Chad. Uh, the International Advisory Board that the World Bank appoints also has an anthropologist who also confirms that, that test of that, of course, land in Africa belongs to the state. Right? When did land in Africa belong to the state? Nobody bothered, obviously, in Chad to know that, that Chadians, where we work, We've been working for 10 years. Even for somebody like me who doesn't speak the language, I actually have come to appreciate that they have at least, at minimum, 11 terms that refer to relationship to property, and that each one of those terms also implies a certain kind of relationship, not only to, to the land itself, but to other people around those plots of land. Right? It doesn't matter. So we, in effect, what the rule of law does is to legitimize, in the context of Chad, very, very colonial laws, those that said as an insult that Africans have, as a, not an insult, but the beginning of an act of expropriation, that Africans have no relationship to land that may constitute, that may be constitutive of property. Right? Um, so that goes for property. The same goes, obviously, for legitimation. 
right? Somebody tells you that we are talking about rural for here, and, and it of course goes to, to the area of governor. Somebody also tells you somewhere that in Chad, of course, we know that Chad will be different because all money will be used to priority sectors. And again, it's intentionality. We have all these things we tell you, these are the sectors in which all is going to be spent and et cetera, et cetera. And to make that sure that that happens, we have a revenue management board. Now, the World Bank obviously will tell you that it has an investment in Chad and therefore has an investment in rule of law and therefore has an investment in, in and they can tell you whatever those priorities are. Um, the World Bank actually has a very vast repertoire of setting up those kind of boards. But in Chad, precisely because of the relationship between the state and the World Bank and the World Bank and World Corporations, they decided that the Revenue Management Board should have four of them from civil society, five from the government. Now, those five from the government get paid by the government. Right? Um, you tell me that when they are talking about revenue management, they have to oversee contracts and etc. If the government wants something, you tell me how the vote will go. Now, the people who are appointed by the government, some of them ex ex are actually permanent members, um, but civil society, they actually have to rot rotate. There's one seat for religious leaders, and that has to go every two years to either a Muslim or a Christian and etc. But so, so those actually rotate, and people in civil society who don't, who don't have the capacity, neither know how about how oil industry works, have no no particular ideas about how finance works, have no idea how contracts actually work, especially international contracts involving anything other than building, buying uh, 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 tin, whatever to make a tin roof, are made to make decisions about contracts that go, bef bids that go before them that are very, very complicated for which they have actually no training. Right? So, that for me is not, and, and this is what I was talking about, the rigging part. If you start looking at how the law was set up or how the institution was created, you begin to be actually suspicious. And it's not just bad faith. So to, for, to me, to say that the, the Revenue Management Board is not working today in Chad, or for the World Bank to say, well, the Chadian government has cooperated, is actually more than half disingenuous. And I'm being polite. Right? Because they actually know that that could not possibly have worked. There was no way. Yes, thank you. There was no way in which that could have worked, right? So it may well be that in many contexts such as those, such as Chad and, and many places in Africa, that in fact Africans are corrupt. <coughs> that may be true. It may be that they just don't know how to do things. That may be true. I've heard many people here talk about Africans. Africans are different, they're all incompetent, ill-disposed, and et cetera, et cetera. All of those may be true. The fact is that it doesn't matter whether it's in, in Chad, in Zambia, or et cetera, that will not work. And I may even dare say that even if you are in America, that may not work. So why would you want that to happen? Right? And so those answers cannot actually be found in Africa. They have to be found in the larger context in which we have the rule of law today, which means that somebody actually should be looking in an area where, right, where basically state regulatory power has, has diminished, where corporations have been given more powers and corporations have been given the powers to self-regulate, to self-monitor, and et cetera, where the state welfare programs in every state have been dismantled. All of those have a name. I don't care what you call them, neoliberalism, Washington consensus, et cetera. There's an, a con context in which the rule of law has become very, very potent instrument of extraction, and literally of extraction, right? There's no African agency that can go against that as long as the, the governing ideology at the World Bank is, in fact, to make it impossible for states to monitor. The, the World Bank doesn't like monitoring regulation in America any more than they do in Africa. Why would you want to set up an agency in Chad that actually has teeth to regulate corporations, or the state for that matter, in the context of which where you have exploitation of oil? Right? So I, I think that that's where actually I, want, I wanted to come, that, that the rule of law in the neoliberal context, which is where I take it, has a particular purpose, and we must not go around it thinking that the question is, is a question of democracy in Africa, it's a question of capacity building. It is not. It is that every sphere of sovereignty is being restructured, of decision making is being restructured to allow certain, for certain action. African, it, those actions be, then become only very visible and scandalous in Africa because the context is already so scandalous in terms of poverty, disease, and et cetera. But we always imagine that it, it is African leaders, which is not to exempt African leaders, by the way, 
But I think that the rule of law, how it's rigged, how it's put together, to what instrumentalities, to what purpose, how they function, how those nodes function, how then bureaucrats in Africa, whether they be judges, local chiefs, and etc., can read those rule, rule of laws and in effect be themselves the filters through which the good that is supposed to be produced, produced is produced as they want them, meaning that to go from crude to refined oil, or to go from very crude context of law implementation to giving legitimacy to things that are very crude in their effect, expropriation, do all those happen? So they become filters in this, which doesn't mean that they don't have agency. Of course, they can manage some time to alleviate something here. They use judgment to be prudent here. Some of them are imprudent, some of them are prudent, etc. But when you assemble all of those together, you still have the same result. There is no way you can reverse the initial claim that Africans don't own property, and therefore you can take it from them and compensate them for 18 months of work. If that, there's no way you can reverse the fact that the International Age, uh, um, Advisory Board uh, Group, the International Advisory Group, that the Revenue Management Board, all of them are toothless. They are by design. We live in an area where regulation actually doesn't count, doesn't matter, nobody wants it. Right? So that is not a plea for African leaders, but a plea to actually replace, re uh, retell all these stories about why these kind of uh, 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 exercises in, 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 in sort of uh, um, um, creating economies in Africa actually fail. There is a lot of things that Africans do for which they are responsible. Even the government of Chad, right? I can tell you a story in which I can talk about nepotism, corruption, and there's all of that in Chad. But even if the Chadian government were not corrupt, nepotistic, and etc., you cannot supplement for those they are not deficiency, but for those instrumentalities, the rule of law has always been read. Thanks.